I'm Hugh Thomas. I'm the director of the Center for the Humanities, and it's uh, our pleasure to bring you to the <laughs> third of the uh, Evolving Humanities series, which was supposed to be last spring, but uh, we all know why that didn't happen. Um, our speaker today is uh, Brendan Balseric Jackson. Uh, he is a, a professor in the philosophy department here. He received his PhD from Cornell, and since that time has of various positions and fellowships in the US, Australia, and Germany. Uh, he came to uh, University of Miami in 2015. Uh, Brendan has published numerous articles and edited several books. His main areas of study are philosophy of language, where his strong background in linguistics comes in handy, uh, and also the areas of epistemology and metaphysics. Um, one nice thing for us at the Humanities Center is he's the coordinator of the Interdisciplinary UM Cognitive Studies Network. We have several interdisciplinary groups, and in this case, it includes people from psychology and so forth, so study of the brain uh, from various directions. And today he's going to be, if I got this correct, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, he's going to be discussing the intersection between philosophy and virtual reality and augmented reality. So uh, thanks, Brendan, and I'll hand it over to you. Okay, great, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here um, so that people can see the slides. Um, yeah, so the, the title for today was um, the philosophy of language because that's one of my main areas of research, but given the, um, given the focus of the series on um, the evolving humanities and how humanities is looking in the 21st century, I thought today I would um, talk about an area of research which is a little bit different, sort of another area that I'm working on uh, which has to do with uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, and um, now, so AR and VR, um, which is gonna be what we're focusing on today, um, uh, is really a 21st century phenomenon, really especially in the last 10 years, but we're actually gonna start the discussion today back in the 17th century uh, and in 1641 in particular uh, with um, uh, a book by the philosopher Rene Descartes called um, uh, Meditations on First Philosophy. Um, and Descartes is doing something really interesting in, in, this, in this book, and it's something that kind of laid um, a challenge down for future generations of philosophers. Um, he was really interested in determining what can we be certain of just by using the powers of our own mind. If I just sit down in my study in a nice comfortable chair with a crackling fire next to me, um, what can I really know for absolute certain just by reflecting and thinking? Um, and his method for approaching that question uh, was uh, what he called his method of doubt, where he tried to take everything that he knew or thought he knew um, and subject it to any kind of doubt or, or nagging worries or any possible reason why it could be less than absolutely certain. Um, so for example, he said, as I'm sitting here in my study, I, it feels to me that I'm sitting in this comfortable chair. I see the crackling fire next to me and feel its warmth and stuff. And he says, but you know, I've had experiences like that before in dreams, very vivid dreams. And uh, nothing while I was dreaming really told me that I was dreaming. It was only later when I woke up that I realized um, that uh, that was all just a dream. So that could be happening right now. I could be dreaming right now. So I can't be absolutely certain that I'm sitting in front of the fireplace right now. Uh, and even more radically, he said, well, you know, we can push that a bit further. Maybe that sensation, that perception of the crackling fire and the comfortable chair, maybe that's being put directly into my mind by a kind of all powerful deceitful demon. I just came to be known as Descartes' demon or his evil demon. And he said, you know, maybe the demon is putting those ideas into my head, those sensations, and maybe the demon has been doing that my whole life. Maybe everything that I thought I was seeing and hearing and feeling and smelling, uh, maybe those were all just illusions put into my mind by this evil demon that's been trying to trick me my whole life. And he, he reasoned, well, if that were so, then many, many of the things that I believe about the world around me would be wrong. I would be wrong to believe that this fireplace is here. I would be wrong to believe that, that the house that it's in is here or that there are trees outside or you know any of those things about um, the external world, the world outside my mind, which to which I have access through my senses, those would all be just mistaken beliefs. I wouldn't know any of those things that I thought I knew. Um, they would just be illusions given to me by this demon. Right? Um, now, Descartes didn't really actually think that was going on. This was just a thought experiment that he used to try to see what he could really be absolutely unshakably certain of uh, and what was open to some kind of doubt. Right? Um, but that challenge that the, the, the evil demon thought experiment um, brought out was what um, 
what nowadays we, we call the problem of external world skepticism. Uh, and skepticism is the idea that we don't know what we think we know. Um, and calling it external world skepticism captures this idea that, that you know, the world external to your mind. So including everything about the objects around you and the events that you observe and even things about your body. Do you really have a body? That's sort of, that's not you know, part of your mind that's external to you in, in Descartes. Sense. And so the challenge was, how do we know any of those things um, that we seem to know through our senses, given that our senses can be tricked, given that they're subject to uh, illusion like this? Um, now, Descartes wasn't the first one to raise this kind of question, the question of external world skepticism. That already, for example, had been discussed by um, Plato and other ancient Greek philosophers. But um, what, what Descartes gave us was this kind of new tool for thinking about it, the, the evil demon thought experiment. Okay, so that's 1641. Uh, now let's flash forward a few years to 1999, so the 20th century now. Um, and a film was released called The Matrix. I'm sure many of you uh, remember this film from when it came out. Um, I'll, I'll talk you through it a little bit because it's, you know, you probably, it's been a long time for all of us since, since we've seen it, and so you might not remember everything. But this was, in a way, a new version of the evil demon um, thought experiment. So here in the middle of the screen, you've got Keanu Reeves playing a character called Neo. And um, as far as Neo knows or is aware at the start of the movie, he's kind of a regular person who lives in a little apartment in a big high rise in a big city. And he works uh, as a computer programmer in a cubicle in a big company. Um, and at night, he kind of dabbles as a hacker and goes out to nightclubs and things like that. Um, and then he kind of gets caught up with, uh, with this sort of shady group of people that you see standing behind him in this picture. Uh, and the leader of that group is somebody named Morpheus, the, the bald guy with the cool glasses um, who's standing right behind Neo. Um, and at some point, you know, Neo says he's always had these sort of worries that, that, that he's missing something, that the world isn't really the way it seems to him to be. And so Morpheus says, well, you know, I can help you. I'm gonna offer you a choice, right? Uh, and he holds out this, this red pill and this blue pill. Um, and he says, if you want to know what the world is really like, and know the truth and know what reality is, then take this red pill and I'll show it to you. Uh, if you wanna keep living in illusion, then take the blue pill and go back to your life, you'll forget this ever happened. Well, of course, you know, we wouldn't have a movie if you took the blue pill and he's curious and he's got this nagging sense of doubt, right? Like Descartes has this doubt. I can't be absolutely certain that things are the way they seem. And so he takes the red pill and you know, various adventures ensue. And what he eventually comes to discover is that, um, that what he thinks is the, the real world is just an illusion. Um, and in fact, the world has been taken over by these evil uh, alien robots, computers, uh, that have enslaved all of humanity and put them in these kind of pod-like things and they've attached cables to their brain. And what those cables do is they feed in directly sensory input into the brains of, of all human beings on the planet. Um, and so what's happening is that they're being given these sensory experiences as though they're going about ordinary lives, driving their cars, going to work, going to the grocery store. But all of that is just generated by computers. Um, and so this, maybe this image is a bit blurry, but there's, these are all supposed to be like numbers and letters and symbols kind of, uh, that's what the world is really, uh, is really going on. And, and so like Descartes is imagining in the evil demon case, what Neo is discovering at least according to Morpheus, when he gives him this choice to discover how things really are or stay, keep living in an illusion, when he discovers how they really are, he's discovering that he was wrong about many of the things he believed about the world. He thought that he lived in an apartment, but he doesn't. He thought that you know he worked in a cubicle, but that cubicle wasn't, wasn't real, it was just an illusion. When he would walk to work and cars would pass by, uh, or when it seemed to him as though cars were passing by, that was all just you know, a hallucination, it wasn't real. It was just an entire world of illusion his whole life. Um, and so here too, we have this problem, this challenge of external world skepticism. How do we know that we're not in that situation right now? Um, nothing that in Neo's life until the point when Morpheus gives him this way out would really show him that, that, that's, that he was suffering from these illusions because all he could do is use his senses and his senses would just give him more of whatever the evil machines wanted him to see. Um, so here we have a kind of 20th century version of this external world skeptical hypothesis kind of thought experiment. Um, and this is still something that, that many philosophers um, today are interested in trying to answer that challenge. How can we know about the external world given that our senses are fallible and subject to illusion? <clears throat> okay, um, so what does any of this have to do with, with virtual reality? Um, well, I wanna first take a minute to um, kind of introduce you to what I mean by virtual reality. And um, uh, you know, I'm not gonna assume that everybody has had all kinds of experience with this stuff before. 
Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how virtual reality, how the technology works. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you a little video of some people undergoing an experience in VR that might help give you a sense of, of what it's like. Um, and um, I think a very common way of thinking of virtual reality is that it's kind of a machine for generating illusions. Uh, and we'll see why in, in just a minute as we go. So what you've got on the screen right now is um, uh, a picture of uh, a VR headset. Um, this is this is one that's pretty widely available, not crazy expensive. You can get it for about four hundred dollars. I mean, it's not cheap, but you know, it's uh, it's not like you know impossible to get. Um, this is called the Oculus Rift, um, and the big thing in the center is a headset that kind of wraps around your head and then fits over your eyes. And notice that once that fits over your eyes your vision is completely occluded, right? There's no, there are no lenses that you can see through in the front and it's all bracketed around the sides so that you don't have any external light coming in. You can't see it, but it goes under the nose as well. So what you see when you're actually in the headset, are there are two little uh, monitors, two screens, like, a, like on a, a LCD screen, um, which are giving you a binocular vision. So you get a 3D image uh, from these two lens, these two screens that are, you know, right up in front of your eyes. Um, and also inside of that headset, there's technology that tracks the motion of your head. Um, uh, it can either track it sort of relative to where it was, but it can also track it in some cases using GPS. Um, and what that does is it tracks as you move your head around, it'll change the image in front of you. Um, so for example, if you were just looking at a computer screen that had a picture of a forest and you held that screen in front of you, I'm sorry, my, my hand is right over <laughs> my face. Um, then as you move around, you would just see that same static image. But when you move around with the VR headset, you see different parts of the forest. If you walk around in a circle, you'll see the back of the tree that you were in front of before. Um, and the effect of that is really powerful. Like it, it, it really feels like you're in a space seeing uh, three-dimensional objects and things happening around you. And of course, there's sound in the headset um, that, um, that adds to that. And the sound is done in that same kind of way. So that if there's a loud thing over here, it'll get louder as you go this way and quieter as you go that way. Um, and this is all just run on a, on a fast laptop computer a little bit. Now those two funny little things on the side are, are um, hand controllers. You, you grip them kind of like this. Um, and those are things that you can use to interact with, um, with the objects and the things that are happening in your, in your virtual experience. Um, they look a bit clumsy uh, when, you, when you just imagine holding them and they have their kind of a circle here, which is sort of, it's like you're holding a weird flashlight. Um, but it's surprising how quickly you get used to that actually when you're using them. Um, there's a, a known effect of um, the way we psychologically um, sort of process our own kind of internal body image. And you can very quickly get used to the idea that actually your arm extends out to the end of this controller so that when you reach out to poke something or, or, or a pet like a virtual dog or anything, um, it just feels like you're just doing it with your hand. You hardly even notice that you're holding these controllers. And so you can use those to poke things, grab things, throw things. And that's how you interact with the, with the virtual environment. So when I talk about virtual reality, the, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. It's an immersive interactive experience. So immersive in the sense that you kind of feel like you're in a, in a, in a new place and you can interact with the things in that place and it's generated by a computer. Um, so that's, you know, the word virtual is used in all kinds of ways. This is what I'm gonna be talking about. Here's that kind of uh, VR uh, situation. So I want to I want to take just a minute here to show you what um, uh, how sort of convincing that can be. Um, I'm going to have to switch apps, so just bear with me for a second. Um, let's see. <clears throat> and I'm going to add a sound here. Okay, so I want to show you um, a little video of a of something called uh, Richie's Plank Experience. And it's a very simple kind of thing. You, and you can do this in a studio or a room. You set up a wooden plank on the ground um, and then you put people into the VR headset and you have them walk along the plank. Um, the only thing that makes it um, uh, unusual is that within the VR headset, what they, what they think they're doing, what they see themselves as doing is walking on a plank that's suspended 60 stories up off the ground, uh, poking out the side of a skyscraper. So that if they were to go off either side, they would, um, they would be falling 60 stories down to the street below. So I'll just show you the video. It's a very short video, it's just to see how people are. No. It's too real. And my thumbs are 
is so cool. I'll have to go back. No, <laughs> I don't want to. Oh my god, oh my god. Okay, so um, I, that was a promotional video from the company that makes it, so it's very melodramatic. But um, but uh, we actually have a small VR lab in the philosophy department, and we have that um, um, that program on our on our equipment in there. And we don't have a big enough budget for a, for a wooden plank, but um, but we can just do it um, just you know in the room without the plank, and you get the same the same reaction. Like we uh, we put through students through this every semester when we uh, teach a certain course on, on virtual reality. And some will kind of stay up against the wall and refuse to do it. Others will like kind of crawl on hands and knees, um, you know, sweaty palms, uh, a lot of all kinds of fear reactions. Um, and what's nice about that video is that you can, it first shows you what we see, um, which is a person standing in a perfectly ordinary room with a headset on. And they know that too, when they're in the headset, they know that, that they're not at the top of the building. Um, and then you see what, how it looks from their perspective inside the, the experience. And, you know, you see the, the, the upper stories of buildings and the street way below, and there's like little wisps of cloud going by. Um, and even though they know it's not real, the illusion is so powerful that they still get the fear reaction and they kind of, kind of part of their brain knows that it's real and part just can't, you know, can't let go of the idea that it is real. Um, so that, that's, you know, that way, this is a very, I think, natural way of thinking about virtual reality. It's this machine that gives you these powerful illusions. Illusions, you know, like the kind of thing that, that we imagine Neo having gone through his whole life when he was in the Matrix, and like Descartes was worried about with the evil demon, things that just that are indistinguishable from reality, and yet they're just illusions. None of that stuff is really happening. It's it's not real. Um, so that's one way of thinking about um, virtual reality, but it's actually not the only way of thinking about virtual reality. And I think considering another way to think about it uh, lets us. Um, uh, develop some new ideas about this old problem of external world skepticism. So let me go back to um, uh, my slides here for a minute, um, because now I want to um, look at uh, a different way of thinking about virtual reality, which is called virtual realism. This is due to uh, a philosopher named um, David Chalmers, uh, who first kind of floated this idea in an article in 2017. Um, and um, here's what, um, what he has to say about it. He asks the question, well, yeah, sure, we all think that virtual reality is about generating illusions, um, but is that right? You know, maybe are virtual objects actually real? Do the avatars and treasures we encounter in VR really exist? Or are they mere illusions? Do the battles or concerts that we experience in VR really happen? Or are they mere fictions? My answer to these questions is yes. Like they're not, they're not illusions, they're not fictions, they're real things. Okay. Now, this is kind of a bizarre idea, um, and it's, you know, my, you might wonder, well, why would you, why on earth would you think this shit? Right. So I think it's worth taking a few minutes to consider how you might convince yourself of this way of thinking of virtual reality. Uh, and one way to do it is to, um, uh, is to kind of dig into the idea of the question of what makes something real. When we say that, like, say, this cup of water is real, what do we mean? What's, what's behind that? Um, well, one thing you might mean is that something is real if it has causal powers. So if it, has certain causes, has certain effects, you know, it can interact with the things around it. So that glass of water, you know, it's, um, it exerts a force on the table that it's sitting on, it holds water. If I knock it over, it'll spill. If I tap it, it'll make a certain sound. These are all causes and effects that the glass has. Um, and that's maybe one criterion for being real is that you have causes and effects. Um, but Chalmers says, well, look, if that's the criterion for being real, then we should consider virtual objects to be real because they do have causes and effects. So if you're playing a virtual game of baseball, 
um, and you swing a virtual bat and it connects with the virtual ball, then those were that was you causing the, the virtual bat to do something. The virtual bat caused the virtual ball to fly into virtual right field. Um, and, um, and so those are real causes and effects. Um, uh, especially important among the causes and effects that uh, we might think make something real are its effects on us, including its, um, its power to cause perceptions in us. Um, so the cup, um, you know, by, by virtue of its being a real thing, it causes me to see it and hear it and feel it when I touch it. Um, but in the same way, Chalmers says, um, you know, the a virtual, if I have a game where I'm, say, trying to steal a treasure from a virtual dragon, the virtual dragon is causing my perceptions of it. Um, go back to Descartes' demon for a minute, right? And when he's imagining being fooled by a demon, um, there isn't anything uh, sort of behind the fireplace as it were that's causing him to have the perception of the fireplace, just the demon. Likewise, his feeling of the chair is just entirely caused by the demon. All of the things that he's experiencing are just caused by the demon. And so in his kind of imagined scenario, the only real thing is the demon. Um, but in, in the virtual reality case, um, it's the virtual dragon that's causing my perception for the virtual dragon uh, and the ball and the bat and so on. Um, in, the, in the thing we just watched with the Planck experience, there, there are these virtual buildings around you. And in fact, in later parts of the game, if you want, you can kind of fly around the city with a jetpack. And as you do, that's the best part. The, the Planck is just a kind of little intro. Uh, as you fly around these buildings, you see them from all sides and stuff. Those, those virtual buildings are what's causing your, your perceptual experiences of them. Okay, so that's maybe one reason to think that virtual objects are real. Uh, another reason to think that they're real is that they're my, what you call they're, they're what you might call public. Right? They're there for anybody to see. Um, we can all put on the headset and go into the Planck experience and see the same buildings. Um, there, there are plenty of VR games um, where, that can have multiple players at once. So go back. We could have a version of that Dragon Treasure game where I'm playing and you're playing and some friend of ours in California are all playing, battling the same dragon. And there, that's the dragon is there, accessible to all of us simultaneously. Um, so it's not something that's just sort of private to my own mental life. It's out there for everybody to uh, get access to. Um, so if that's a criterion for real reality, that's another reason to think that virtual objects uh, might be real. Uh, a third kind of criterion that Chalmers doesn't talk about uh, quite as much, but which I think is is also important, uh, is this notion of what we might call objectivity. Objectivity is what makes something real. And um, to explain a bit of what I mean about that, um, imagine, so there's a palm tree outside my window here. That's, you don't have to imagine that that's real. Um, and suppose that um, it's standing still, but that for a second, it looks to me like it's kind of swaying back and forth. Um, now it could be doing that because you know, I'm actually swaying back and forth, uh, or it could be maybe there's a ripple in the glass of the window that makes it look like it's swaying. Um, but still, that was just a sort of momentary appearance that it was swaying. In reality, objectively speaking, it was standing still. Right? So we have to make this distinction between how it really is objectively and how it appeared to. Um, but it turns out we need to make that same distinction when we're talking about virtual objects and experience in, in VR. Um, so for example, suppose that I'm playing a game where I have to kind of move through a post-apocalyptic city battling robots and saving human survivors. Right? Um, there, there, is, there are many such games um, that you can buy. Um, I might be moving through a street and up ahead, I see what seems to me to be a robot. And so I move forward to kind of engage it and fight. But as I get closer, I realize, no, it's actually a human. Um, so there, how do we describe that? Well, we have to say, well, it looked to me, it appeared to me like a robot at first, but it was really a human, right? And so we have to have the same distinction between how it appeared and how it objectively is, even though it's just a virtual object. Now, if virtual objects were nothing but appearances, we couldn't make that distinction um, because there, the appearance, there is no object that appear, was one way and appeared another way. There would be just the appearances. So if we think of objectivity as important for being real, then that's maybe further reason to think that virtual objects are real. Well, suppose that that's right. Suppose that virtual objects are real. Um, then you know, what kind of things are they, right? I mean, they're like a virtual apple. Suppose you're playing a grocery store game. Believe it, believe it or not, there are those two where you just go and walk around a grocery store, um, you know, and you pick up a virtual apple. Well, it's not like the apple that you'd get in a real grocery store. It's, there's something different about it. Um, and what Chalmers suggests is that, well, deep down, when you think about the causal powers of that virtual apple and the objective facts about it and the things that make it publicly accessible to all of us, um, those are ultimately due to facts about 
uh, data structures sort of deep down in the computer. Um, so that's a kind of, the picture here is a kind of graphic representation of a data structure. Um, but so the idea is that deep down a virtual apple is um, kind of made up of data structures, which you can really just think of as a kind of mathematical object. Um, now, you know, if that's what they are, then, then there, there's a sense in which they really don't reveal their true nature when you look at them. When you look at a virtual apple, it doesn't look like a data structure. It doesn't, um, you know, it, it, uh, you wouldn't have much of an idea about that just by kind of examining it. But we can say that for the apples at the grocery store as well, right? If, you know, if you talk to a physicist, they'll tell you that, well, that apple that you're holding in your hand is actually deep down a kind of swirling cloud of subatomic particles that are mostly zipping through empty space. Well, and just examining the apple in the store doesn't really tell you that either, right? Um, so, um, so in both cases, in the case of the virtual apple, but also in the case of the apple in the store, their true kind of underlying nature isn't very well revealed by, by what we can see and, and how, when, when we interact with them in ordinary ways. Um, so what does this have to do then with external world skepticism? Um, well, let's go back to Neo uh, and you know this situation with Morpheus, where Morpheus tells him that everything he thinks is an illusion and that we should learn the truth. Um, Neo is really, has been living in a world of virtual objects his whole life. Right? He's been, you know, he's living in a virtual apartment, sleeping in his virtual bed, going to his virtual cubicle by riding the virtual bus and so on. Right? Um, and uh, if we adopt this kind of virtual realist way of thinking of things, then those were real objects. Um, and so insofar as he believes um, that say, uh, he left his jacket in, the, in his cubicle. He's right. That's not an illusion. He's not wrong about that. He really has a jacket. He really has a cubicle. They're just virtual objects. Um, and so, um, so when, Neo, when Morpheus tells him that he's really wrong about um, so many of the things that he believes about the external world, a virtual realist like Chalmers would say, no, no, he's not wrong. He, has, he knows what's going on in the world around him. He knows it's full of these objects. If he's wrong about anything, he, it was in wrong assumptions about what's the kind of deep nature underlying those objects. Neo might have thought, oh, those objects are ultimately, ultimately made up of atoms and subatomic particles interacting in certain ways, but really they're made up of data structures. But, you know, the idea that we could be wrong about kind of, you know, big scientific hypotheses about the, the underlying nature of the objects in our world is not so startling as the idea that we could be wrong about like most of what we believe about life. Um, so in a way, this is a more optimistic take on the external world skepticism problem. Um, it, it kind of suggests that we couldn't really be massively globally wrong about what we perceive. Um, at most, we could be making false assumptions about what it's like deep down. Like, is it really a world of atoms or a world of numbers? Um, but either way, the world as we see it is real. Yeah. So um, that's one way in which thinking about um, sort of contemporary virtual reality technology can kind of Help us look at these these very long-standing problems in, in philosophy in, in a new way. Um, okay. Okay. Good. So, um, so if you've gone with me this far, I want to try to go one step further um, and look at augmented reality. And uh, so, again, first, I'm going to say just a little tiny bit about uh, what I mean by augmented reality. And uh, what I want to suggest here is that even as um, this technology gives us new ways of thinking about these traditional philosophical problems. Um, it also raises new interesting philosophical questions to which I at least don't know the answers, but I think it's fun to, to think about. Um, so again, what do I mean by augmented reality? Um, by far the most widespread common uh, sort of augmented reality technology is, is uh, based on smartphones. You might have some on your own smartphone. If not, there's about you know, 17,000 apps that you could download right now to try it out. Um, this one pictured here is um, a game called Pokemon Go, from which was popular a couple of years ago, like had a real big uh, buzz a couple of years ago. Notice what's going on in this picture is that the person is holding their smartphone and um, they're using the camera on their smartphone to look at the street in front of them. So that's really an image of their street with people running by and stuff. Um, what, the, um, what the app does is it adds in this little yellow beastie here, which is uh, it's, it's called Pikachu. It's a kind of squirrel rabbit thing. I'm not sure what he is. Um, but there he is standing on the street in front of you. Uh, and so in this game, um, the object of the game, I, I take it, I, I have to confess I never played, um, is you move around the real world, the environment around you, looking for little creatures like that and other little treasures, and then kind of uh, they play or fight or something. Um, but there's, there's a lot of apps like this. Um, 
they have all kinds of applications. So for example, um, you can download an app from the IKEA store uh, if you like, um, which will let you um, with the same smartphone kind of look at your living room uh, and then choose say a sofa or a bookcase or something from the IKEA catalog and then press a button, it'll just drop into the place you want it in your living room so you can see what it would look like. Uh, and you can try orienting it in different ways and stuff, change the color of the upholstery. So you can kind of shop for IKEA things from home, see exactly how they would fit in your room. Um, there are also apps that um, uh, let you make street art. So you can go to um, you know, really any, any place you like and you can kind of start spray painting using your phone, you know, write your initials or draw a picture on the wall and then that'll be geotagged and anybody with the app can come along and, and look at the thing that you made there. Also, you can do 3D sculptures that way. Um, there are some fantastic uh, things in Wynwood, right? Uh, um, that um, you can download apps that will let you look at some of the street art in, in Wynwood, some of the murals that are painted there. And when you use these apps, you'll see kind of three-dimensional animated kind of uh, elaborations of what's going on on the wall. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff that you, that you can do with, uh, with this technology. Um, there are, I mean, the, the phone-based ones are by far the most common, but there are also more advanced uh, kind of headset-based versions of this, um, which can let you do more. The, the, these have the advantage that you, you don't have to hold a phone with one hand, so um, you can uh, do more. Um, also, the, these, the, the more powerful ones like you, like you see here, uh, have a function where they can read your hand gestures. So you can use just gestures from your hands to control what's going on in the program, which is pretty cool. Um, so notice that with these headsets, unlike the previous ones, there are glass lenses here. And that's really kind of an, an indication of the, of the major difference between VR and AR. And one way to think of it is that, um, well, VR takes you and kind of transports you to a new place, uh, you know, a virtual place. Um, what these things do is they take virtual objects and transport them into your real surroundings. Um, so it's not immersive in the same way, but it's more kind of whatever the opposite of immersive is, exmersive. Um, so I don't think that's a real word, but uh, maybe it should be. Um, okay, so again, I just wanna show really briefly a little bit about what, um, uh, what some of this stuff looks like when you actually use it. So I'm gonna show a, um, a really quick video of a, um, of a little, uh, augmented reality pet dragon that you can get. Um, so the only Okay. Um, I personally find that dragon really irritating, so I wouldn't recommend that um, that particular app. But um, there are lots of uh, virtual pets that you can that you can get this way. Um, okay. So what's interesting then about augmented reality as opposed to virtual reality? Um, you know, I think. Before we started thinking about virtual realism, uh, it would have been very natural to say, say in that in that little pet dragon scenario, well, what the app lets you do uh, is have an illusion for fun, have an illusion as of a little dragon standing on your kitchen counter or on the sort of seminar room table. Um, but now, if we've gone sort of along with Chalmers in the in the virtual uh, realism kind of way of thinking, then that isn't an illusion. That's a real dragon. I mean, it's a real virtual dragon. Um, it doesn't have um, the same underlying nature as a, as a biological dragon would, but it's real, and it's really there, standing on your kitchen counter or standing uh, in your office. Um, and you know that's that's that sounds weird to begin with, but I think once you, once you start really digging into that idea, it becomes it raises lots of puzzles. Right? Um, I mean, one maybe the most basic kind of puzzle is um, uh, what you might think of as a kind of puzzle about co-location. So suppose that I have one of these pet dragons and I put it on my kitchen counter. And suppose you take out your app uh, and because you want to play with your pet dragon and you put it in the same spot on the kitchen counter. We can do that. Um, I'll, I'll be interacting with my dragon, you'll be interacting with yours, but they're both standing in the same place on the kitchen counter at the same time. Um, now, ordinarily, objects can't do that. Um, you know, that's, in, in fact, we might think of that as another kind of criterion for being real, like those others we talked about before, uh, is that, um, you know, a real object takes up space. And when it's there, other things can't be there. 
uh, that doesn't seem to be the way it is with, with virtual dragons that we can uh, put into, um, into AR, uh, sorry, into our environments using AR technology. Um, now that's a kind of you know, abstract philosophical question, you know, how do we make sense of this idea of two different objects being co-located? But it does have, uh, I think, further practical um, or sort of more everyday life kind of ramifications. Uh, some of these things have to do with um, questions about uh, ethical issues and how we treat each other. Um, so for example, um, suppose that you're running a, um, a coffee shop, a cafe, and I decide to just set up like, you know, a huge billboard for my uh, coffee shop right in the doorway of your cafe. And it's an, it's an augmented reality, it's a virtual billboard. Um, so um, uh, it's not g getting in the way of anybody, right? they can still walk through the door, but it's a real thing that I've just put right in front of the door to your coffee shop. Can I do that? Do you have a right to tell me that I can't put that there? Um, these would seem, if, if this was just an illusion, it would seem obvious that I do have a right to do that. I mean, I'm not really doing anything. It's just an illusion that I'm doing something. Um, but if we think of that billboard as a real virtual object, um, then it looks like I am putting a real object in the doorway of your cafe. Or take the, the uh, graffiti app that I mentioned before, the street art app. I can use that to make some really nice street art, but I could also use it, or let's say you could use it to come spray offensive things about me all over the side of my house, right? Um, again, if that were just an illusion, it's hard to know exactly what would be wrong with it. But if you're really doing that to my house, you're really putting something there on the side of my house, then it seems like uh, we're gonna have to have a discussion about how to negotiate that issue. Um, so as I say, I mean, th these are just, I think kind of the tip of the iceberg when we think of virtual reality is actually just adding virtual objects to the world. And we think of augmented reality is really just augmenting the environment around us with new kinds of objects, then, you know, all kinds of new philosophical and practical questions arise. Now, as I said, I don't have answers to those questions, but I'm more than happy to talk about them with all of you and really any kind of questions you have about VR and AR and um, uh, any of that stuff. So I'm looking forward to discussing. Well, thanks very much, Brendan. That was, uh, well, I learned a lot and uh, I imagine our audience did as well. Um, I'll just remind people if you do have questions, um, the way to deliver them is to type them into the Q&A. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that function, take your mouse or whatever and go down and hover at the bottom. Usually it's at the bottom. And you'll see a little thing called Q&A. You click on that, you type in the question, and then uh, I'll be monitoring and uh, um, uh, reading them to Brendan. Uh, but while we wait for people to bring in their own questions, uh, I'm going to ask if there's any intersection between the kinds of things you're talking about here and much older debates about, say, the reality of concepts. Uh, is honor a thing? Does it have reality? Um, do ideas have reality? Um, is that a completely different kind of um, question, or is this, you know, is this one that has similarities? Well, I think, um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I guess there, there are a number of ways we could, um, uh, we could go with it. But if you think of, um, say, concepts or ideas, um, uh, there's, they're certainly real in a sense, right? Now, there, I mean, I talked before about um, uh, this idea that a real thing is located somewhere, right? It takes up space. And it's, concepts and ideas don't really take up space. Um, and so that makes some people uh, want to say that they're a special kind of entity, they're kind of an, what they would call an abstract entity. Um, it's real, but it doesn't exist in any place or at any particular time, it's just there kind of in, in reality. Uh, another thing that's thought of that way is um, uh, like numbers, for example, that people sometimes think that numbers are real things, but you can't find them, you can't kick them, they don't have any color, um, they're abstract. Um, I guess you could have a similar idea about the things you're interacting with in virtual reality, that somehow you're interacting with abstraction, the abstract idea. Um, but if so, then they're very different because these do have colors and shapes, right? you know, and they seem to have causes and effects. And so I think for somebody like Chalmers, who I talked about um, during the presentation, that makes him want to say they're not abstract. Um, another maybe similar idea you could have is that um, they're like characters in a story, right? Um, you know, what should we say about, um, oh, you know, Huck Finn or uh, Frodo from the Lord of the Rings, you know, are they, they're, they're real in a way, but they're not, you know, again, you're not gonna find them anywhere. Um, 
so that's I think maybe that's um, uh, probably a more natural initial view about virtual reality is that this is a special kind of story that you're interacting with. It's an interactive story. Um, Chalmers thinks that that's ultimately wrong because it doesn't make sense of this idea that the things we're interacting with are causing our experiences. Thanks. Um, we've got a couple of questions uh, in. Um, one is fairly practical. Are the VR headsets in the lab available to students? Can I set up a VR appointment? <laughs> yeah, there are. So, um, so in our lab, um, nothing is available right now because of the current uh, situation. Actually, ordinarily in the spring, um, my partner Magdalena and I co-teach a course uh, which is called Virtual Reality and Immersive Experience. Uh, which is kind of all about um, VR and some of the philosophical issues and psychological issues. Um, and that involves some time in, in the lab. Um, and in the future, we're hoping to have kind of regular lab hours where people can come in. Um, you can also, you can check out, there is some stuff in the library. There's some Richter library. They have, I think, at least two um, portable VR headsets that, uh, that you can check out for periods of time. Um, so that's, I, again, I don't know if you're doing that right now because of the, the situation, but in general, you can check those out. Um, the, the one that I showed is um, uh, a picture of, that needs a computer to run, so you have to plug it into a computer. But the, these portable ones, you can get, they're self-contained, but you can do that anywhere. All right, thanks. I, I'll, I'll just chime in real quick that uh, we, we've we actually rented one from the Richter Library. <laughs> so it's, um, uh, they have the Oculus, and I think they also have some augmented reality headsets do. Um, you have to go to the creative studio at Richter if you want to search and inquire about whether or not they're actually renting that equipment out during COVID. Um, that's the only thing I don't I don't know, like you said, Brendan. But um, but yeah, they're there. We've used them. They're a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. um, no, and you're right. They have a, um, a lab with uh, where you can get the, the AR headsets. I showed that picture of three ones and one was kind of bug eye looking. That's the Magic Leap one, which is the University of Miami has a collaboration with Magic Leap, and so they, they have a bunch of kind of prototypes that they uh, have been using. I guess they're a bit beyond the state of the prototype, but uh, those are cool too. Really fun. Well, thanks. Uh, the next question is, or, or it's actually a suggestion that you can respond to, uh, and it is, I think the big difference between real and virtual is that virtual is only visible to those that have the equipment or gadgets to see them with something real can be seen uh, or felt by all. Yeah, this is, this I think is a fair point. Um, and I think that um, that's part of what makes us want to say that, that these things are not real, that they're somehow just, just illusions. Um, now, on the other side to try to kind of, you know, push the, the alternative way of thinking, there are plenty of things we all agree are real, but that we can't see without special equipment. Uh, you know, think of, um, um, you know, really even like a salt crystal. You can't see the structure of a salt crystal without some kind of magnifying device. Um, or think of, you know, distant galaxies. Um, and there are things like black holes that we can't even see directly. We only see them indirectly via their effect on things around them. Um, so, um, you know, one could say, and I imagine like a really kind of diehard virtual realist would say, yeah, there are some objects that you can only see with a, if you, you know, have a, Oculus Rift running a certain kind of program, um, but that doesn't make it any less real than a black hole or a salt crystal. Okay, uh, the next question. On this view, are the contents of dreams real objects? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like that. That's a good, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I hope not. <laughs> uh, no, I think, um, I mean, one, um, uh, one way I, I, I get the idea is that if you if you take up that kind of way of thinking, how far does it extend, right? And is it going to kind of blow up? And you know, we get too much stuff. Um, one way to try to keep it from blowing up would be to um, to go back to these ideas about um, well, what qualifies something as real? Right? And in in the case of a dream, um, we don't seem to have this um, uh, this public availability criterion met. Um, nobody else can really see my that are in my dreams um even i mean the way we talk about dreams is a bit weird because you know you and i could have the same dream in a sense but like the monster that's chasing me isn't the same as the monster that's chasing you mine is my monster and yours is yours even if they look the same right? 
Um, so that seems like they're not, the, the dream monster isn't really a publicly available object. Um, and so that's some reason to think it's not real in the way that virtual objects are, uh, even if you think virtual objects are, are real. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, what role might corroboration of senses play here? For example, you might see a very real looking apple via VR or AR, but you cannot touch it, smell it, or eat it as you could with an actually real apple. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is, um, you know, for people who are really into this stuff, this is a source of sadness that we can't, can't do this. <laughs> um, there, I mean, to a certain extent, this is um, a kind of question of the limits of technology. So um, uh, the, there are more elaborate uh, and expensive and somewhat more experimental um, VR setups that involve what they call a haptic suit, um, which is like a, a full body suit that, um, that will give you feelings of pressure so that you can feel like you're being touched. Um, or if you, um, for example, were to um, uh, say, stick your, you're looking through a virtual closet of fur coats and you would stick your arm through the, the fur coats, you would feel kind of a brushing feeling. And that's, that's definitely better than, um, than just the vision and the sound. Um, actually, even the little one that I showed, the, the, the hand controllers have a kind of, um, what they call a haptic feedback device, that they, they vibrate. Um, so for example, there's, um, there's one experience which involves um, a pet, a bit like that dragon pet that I showed uh, before. One of the things you can do is pet the dragon. And when you do, it purrs, and you can feel it purring while your hand is on it because the, the, the controller is vibrating. Um, so that does actually, you know, that gives you some of that. But I don't think you're ever going to be able to um, to get VR that that lets you taste things. Um, and you could do VR that you can smell, but I don't think anybody really wants to. It's you know, it's like those those kind of old smell vision things. It just doesn't work very well. You know, lighting a bunch of different candles and stuff. Um, so it's going to have limits. That's true. Um, but um, but yeah, what that means for the reality of these things, I don't know. I mean, um, not everything that's real has to have a certain smell, for example. Um, you know, maybe they could just look and feel a certain way without having any particular smell or taste. It might still be real, um, but um, but yeah, it's it's true. It's a kind of a limitation of the of the technology that might be in principle at some point. Okay, we have several more questions, but only time for one more. So I apologize for the uh, to people okay. the last couple of questions. But the uh, the next question that came in uh, in sequence is a. Uh, perhaps a little bit more sophisticated and specific version of my question. Uh, and the question is, is Plato's theory about the world of everyday appearances versus the ideal world similar to this? Uh, it is, I mean, I mentioned early on that, um, that uh, Plato was one of the first people to raise this kind of uh, external world skepticism possibility and just the appearance reality kind of question. Now his, his metaphor, his thought experiment was a cave, right? And, and being in, in a cave and looking at shadows playing on a, on a cave wall. And these are shadows of the real things that, you know, that are sort of in the sunlight coming in from the, that are outside the cave and the sunlight outside is casting shadows on the wall so that you see them. And if you had lived your whole life in the cave, you would just think that that's what the world was, was just these shadows. But then when you turn around and head out to the cave, you see, ah, that's the real things. That's again, this idea that we could be totally wrong about how things really are because all we have to go on are our senses. And Descartes gave a different version of that where it was the, with the evil demon. And then we saw a new version of it with the matrix. Uh, so, uh, I mean, interesting question then uh, is what do we say about shadows? <laughs> um, and I actually do think that shadows are real things. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're a bit odd too, but, uh, but they're real things. Okay, well, unfortunately we're now out of time. Um, so uh, I'd like very much to thank Brendan for doing for giving this great talk. And I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we have a, uh, of the next one, you'll get uh, notifications about that uh, by uh, our colleague in English, Lindsay Thomas. Hmm. Uh, so thanks for joining us. And uh, uh, if you do have any questions remaining, uh, maybe send an email and uh, we can pass it on. Yeah, please. I wanted to just say before, oh. you, before you go that, I mean, I since we didn't get to everybody, um, please feel free to email me um, with, um, with whatever questions you have, or if you want recommendations for like AR things to check out or whatever, uh, I'm happy to, uh, happy to reply. Um, I guess the, maybe the, I don't have any way to make my email available, but you can get it from the, the organizers um, uh, easily enough, so.
uh, I'm happy to, an to answer questions that you need. Great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Brendan, again, and thanks for everybody for attending. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at uh, our next installment. Yeah, thanks for your questions. Again. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah.